A powerful dark weapon has been given to our king, Enlil, which reduced enemy lands to dust, which destroyed rebel lands. Also, the shepherd, Uanamu, destroyed the mountains and poisoned them, ravaged the evil one's city, and turned it into a haunted place with such a mighty destruction. Uanamu has also blown his fiery gas into the rebel land's house, written in Sumerian cuneiform. The context of Genesis 14 sets it apart from all other patriarchal narratives in the Bible. Abraham defends Canaan from an invasion from the east in 2085 BC. From Abraham's birth in 2167 BC to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in 2067 BC, it was part of a vast panorama of history. The western lands and the space facilities were now under the control of the government. Large-scale destruction of the cities of the Levant is observed between 2100 and 2000 BC, which coincides with the end of the Early Bronze Age. According to traditional chronology, the Third Dynasty of Ur ruled from 2114 BC to 2004 BC during these years. Because no other Mesopotamian king of the era fits the biblical background so well, these years have been adjusted by ten to reflect ur Namu and Abraham. The Gutian Horde still controlled Lower Mesopotamia in 2167 BC when Abraham was born in Ur. As early as 2109, the Gutians were driven out of Mesopotamia by Utu Hegal of Uruk. A governor of his usurped the throne and seized control in 2102 BC. The Sumerian king list records ur Namu as ruling for 18 years. The name Sin, adopted by ur Namu and the subsequent kings, suggests that this deity and its priesthood assisted them. As Abraham's father, Terah served the deity Ishkur, the Greek Ares, the Nibiruan god of war, in Ur. Adad's control over the Hittite lands placed them in a dangerous position, so they wisely migrated to Haran in northern Mesopotamia, a city on the edge of the Hittite lands. In 2100, Ur-Namu invaded Palestine for the first time. Shortly after that, he consolidated his position among the Mesopotamian cities. Genesis only implies the invasion, but Josephus's antiquities describe it. A treaty was forced on these cities by Ur-Namu, Sodom, Gomorrah, Admar, Siboyim, and Zoar. In those days, these cities were located in the valley, which is now covered by the northern part of the Dead Sea. In Genesis, the cities maintained the pact for twelve years. In the thirteenth year, they rebelled. A fourteenth year invasion took place by the eastern kings. It is believed that Adad, Prince Ishkur, imperial consort of Queen Nehusag, or Isis, or Hera, fomented the rebellion, as Abraham was sent to Canaan and Egypt in 2091, a few years before they rebelled, apparently to prepare for an invasion from the east. A princess as a bride and troops presumably accompanied Abraham back from Egypt the year before the invasion. Abraham divided his forces at Bethel near Ai. Lot took his troops east to defend the city of Sodom in the Valley of Sidim. Hebron, a fortress city controlled by the Anakim, Anunnaki, became the base of Abraham's operations south of the Jordan River. Thus, Adad's grand strategy was to defend the land, particularly the space complex in northern Sinai. There were three components to the strategy. One, Rephaim fortresses defended the king's highway in the Transjordan. Their impregnability was believed to be unbreakable. Two, as the army of Lot reinforced the five cities of the plain, they protected the approach through the Jordan Valley. Additionally, Beth Shean and Jericho were major citadels blocking this route. Three, thirdly, the lands west of the valley could be invaded through Jerusalem. Besides Abraham's forces, the fortress of Hebron was defended by an Egyptian contingent and Anakim or Rephaim allies. According to Abraham's forces' disposition south and north of Jerusalem and Sinai, much more than the Valley of Sidim cities were under his protection. 
The security of the Kadesh Barnea and Mount Sinai space complex was his primary concern. Under the leadership of ur Namu, the eastern kings invaded the western lands the following year. The Haggadah describes an army of 800,000 as quickly penetrating the Transjordan and destroying the Rephaim fortifications. They passed through this heavily defended area with extreme rapidity, indicating the use of special mass-destructive weapons supplied by their deity Sin, Prince Nana, Hermes, Thoth. In addition to liberating Lot and his men, Abraham retrieved most of the booty from the rear train of the rapidly departing army after he engaged the enemy at Don, north of the Sea of Galilee, and again near Damascus. The invading army would have easily defeated Abraham's army if it had stood its ground. There was, however, an unstated reason for the army's flight back home. Why the invaders did not fight Abraham's small forces and preserve their loot and prisoners is puzzling. Ur Namu is known to have fallen ill on an expedition to a foreign mountain land and died soon after returning to Ur, his capital city. Possibly, he succumbed to the effects of his own weapons, such as chemical toxicity or radioactive fallout. In Canaan, a quiet period seems to have ensued after Shulgi became king. According to Abraham's treatment of Hagar, his Egyptian wife, and Ishmael, their son and heir, during this interim period, he broke relations with Egypt. The cities reaffirmed their loyalty to the dynasty of Ur and returned to the eastern kings. Yahweh portrays Adad as a vindictive, vengeful god in the Old Testament. It was not surprising that he retaliated against the cities of the plain. This was a logical decision in light of Adad's inability to defend them successfully against Mesopotamian power. He ruptured the valley floor using mass destructive weapons and created the inland sea in 2067 BC. Genesis briefly mentions Abraham's family background which states laconically, Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of Abram, and they all left Ur of the Chaldeans and moved to Canaan. However, once they reached Haran, they settled there. Genesis does not provide any insight into Abraham's early life and activities in Ur, the city where he was born and raised. The omissions of Genesis are filled in by other sources, for example, Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews. In the Haggadah, the Hebrews recorded their oral tradition based on the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Apocalypse of Abraham, and the Book of Jubilees. Abraham was the descendant of high priests who served the local deities of Mesopotamia, according to Jubilees. He was taught the sciences of the Chaldeans by his father, Nahor, who was raised in Ur among the Chaldeans, and practiced divination and astrology according to the signs of the heavens. His grandson, Abraham, assisted Nahor in his priestly duties. This resulted in at least four generations of priests serving Ur. As a result of political turmoil at that time, the migration may have been prompted by the destruction of Enlil, or Nanar Sin's temple. As mentioned in the Jubilees, Abraham differed from his father in his 60th year and burned down the temple containing idols. To save the idols, Haran dashed into the fire but was killed. According to this source, Terah and his family left Ur because they destroyed the temple. The Book of the Apocalypse of Abraham provides the most detailed and fascinating account of Abraham's early life. As it is sometimes called, the Slavonic Apocalypse of Abraham originated in Hebrew in Palestine in the first century AD. As an astrologer and idol maker, Terah is described in this document. His son helped Terah run a workshop that produced idols for temples in Mesopotamia as well as for private use. The value of these items was determined by their substance and artistry. They were made of stone, wood, iron, copper, silver, and gold. As communicator radio sets, these idols were probably the teraphim of the Old Testament and the animated idols of the Sumerians with devices embedded in the statues and power packs inserted in the eyes. According to the Haggadah, 
Abraham's father was a prince and magnate in the king's house. Thus, Terah and Abraham were intimately connected with the fortunes of this ruling family. When Abraham was 75 years old, he left Haran for the land of Canaan. During this period of 14 years, he lived in Haran between 2106 and 2092 BC. Despite the scripture's silence, events elsewhere rapidly come to an end. Ur-Namu was gradually subduing the other cities of Mesopotamia as he consolidated his newly acquired position in Ur. His attention was then turned to the western lands. Despite serving Chedor Laomer for twelve years, they rebelled in the thirteenth year. In the fourteenth year, Chedor Laomer and his allies came. The Canaanite Sumerian Pact, probably led by Ur-Namu, was signed fourteen years earlier in 2098 BC. In Josephus's view, this treaty resulted from an invasion by the kings of Mesopotamia. Conquerors who imposed a tribute on the kings of the Sodomites who submitted to slavery for twelve years. During Abraham's time at Haran, the earlier invasion occurred. Uanamu must have witnessed these events, showing his policy's success. In the ninety-one years following Agade's destruction, the Gutian hordes ruled Mesopotamia. Utu Hegel established the kingship at Uruk for seven years. The term smitten with weapons usually refers to unusual widespread destruction, such as through non-traditional weapons, such as divine weapons. King List then cryptically states, Uruk's kingship was carried off to Ur after it was struck by weapons. Such a transfer of power is infrequent. Ishkur, Adad, and Utu, Shamash, helped defeat the Gutians and restore the kingship to Uruk through the clay tablet left by Utu Hegel of Uruk. Utu was the god of Anatolia, while Adad was the god of the Western Lands. Did Terah and Abraham serve these gods? Upon Ur-Namu's establishment of his capital in Ur, they would have been forced to leave their home city. Among the kings of this dynasty, Amar-Sin, Shu-Sin, and Ibi-Sin allied themselves to Ur-Namu, who was supported by Nana-Sin and the entire priesthood. It must have been more than just a vague impulse to settle in a new land that inspired the migration. Genesis's abbreviated version of Abraham's activities makes it clear that he was more than just a nomadic chief. He could mobilize many troops on short notice and engage a formidable invading horde. So, Abraham received his marching orders in 2092, his fifteenth year in Haran. Abraham is instructed by Yahweh in Genesis to take Sarah and Lot, as well as all the possessions and people they had acquired in Haran, to Canaan. His contingent may have been significant given the number of people they obtained in Haran. Gods communicated for months initially. The Hebrews heavily influenced Abraham and his entourage in the area south of Sheshem. The Terebinth, Oak, Moreh provided Abraham, enabled him to travel throughout the land to Sheshem. Moreh at Sheshem was said to be a soothsayer Terebinth, according to the Book of Judges. At Bethel, Adad instructed Abraham to go to Egypt, where he stayed for five years, according to Jubilees. Was Abraham's visit there to secure their help in the coming war? It is unknown what he did during these years, although Josephus implies he moved in the highest circles since he taught the Egyptians many sciences they were unfamiliar with. It is common practice when allies strike a treaty to take an Egyptian wife, a princess and a pharaoh's daughter as wives. The Haggadah states that Abraham's father, Terah, was a prince and magnate in the house of the ruling family of Ur, which proves Abraham's aristocratic status. Adad initiated a new line of descent under Isaac due to a change in fortune. Abraham's bride, Hagar, is apparently Adad's choice for starting a dynasty in Canaan under Abraham. As a result, Ishmael was named heir apparent when they had their first child. When Abraham learned of the attack from the east, he must have sought Egyptian military assistance. 
Hadad had previously communicated with Abraham in Bethel in 2086 when Abraham returned to Canaan. About a year before the invasion, this conference was held. As a result of subsequent events, the Plain Cities must have abrogated their treaty with Ur at this time, probably on the initiative of Ardard. The task of establishing defenses was entrusted to Abraham. Abraham was instructed at Bethel to divide his forces. Before a direct assault through the Jordan Valley, Lot deployed part of his army eastward to the Valley of Sidim for Sodom's protection. At that time, Hebron was the strong citadel of Yenakim, or Rephaim, Anunnaki. Abraham led his troops and Egyptian troops southward to Hebron. In addition to Mamre, Eshkol, and Aner, he received sword from the Anakim generals. It is noteworthy that Abraham didn't deploy his forces north of Jerusalem, where they should have been deployed. The invading army targeted El Paran in the northern Sinai south of Jerusalem and Hebron. As events developed, it became apparent that he was protecting some place south of Jerusalem and Hebron. The Transjordan was a third possible route to the Sinai. The King's Highway, the leading trade route, was located in that mountainous region under the control of Adad and Abraham's powerful allies, the Rephaim. It was believed to be impenetrable due to its chain of fortified bastions. During Abraham's defenses, where was the Valley of Sidim, where Sodom and Gomorrah were located? To maximize his chances of success, Abraham strategically deployed his forces as 2085 BC approached. His position appeared impregnable when allied with the Egyptians, Anakims, and Rephaims. While tradition places them under the shallow or southern parts of the Dead Sea, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other infamous cities of the Valley of Sidim have never been physically located. Second, we will address the false assumption that the Dead Sea has existed in this form for hundreds of thousands of years. Based on scripture or other sources, neither supposition can be supported. It appears that the cities were located in the northern part of the Dead Sea and that the Dead Sea dates back only to Abraham's time. There has been a cohesive group among the five cities. There was often a geological link between Sodom, Gomorrah, Admar, Zeboim, and Zoar or Bela, as though they were neighbors in the Valley of Sidim. Genesis implied that the five cities were also associated commercially after rebelling against the Mesopotamian kings and refusing to pay tribute. A trading consortium of an alliance is also mentioned on the Ebla tablets. If it weren't contained south of Jericho for about 50 miles, 80 kilometers, the Dead Sea would have continued into the Wadi Arabah, an extension of the Jordan Valley. What are the characteristics of this dominant geographical feature? Currently, the Jordan River flows through a valley that extends 65 miles, 100 kilometers, from the Sea of Galilee north to the Dead Sea south, with a width between 3 and 14 miles and an overall length of 200 miles, 320 kilometers, the valley's river bends and twists in many loops. Except during spring floods, the river is 90 to 100 feet, 25 to 30 meters wide, and 3 to 10 feet, 1 to 3 meters deep. Because of the 590-foot drop between the two bodies of water, the river has a swift current. After descending 200 miles, it disappears entirely into the Dead Sea. Abraham's time was not like that, according to historical evidence. After passing the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan Valley continued into the Wadi Arabah, exiting into what is now the Dead Sea. The Gulf of Aqaba may have been its final destination. There was a great deal of fertility in the valley. Genesis describes it as, Lot looked around and saw how thoroughly watered the whole Jordan plain was, all the way to Zoar, like Yahweh's own garden, or like Egypt's land. As a result, the Valley of Sidim is often compared to the Garden of Eden and the Nile Valley in terms of its green luxuriance. In the thicket or jungle of the Jordan, there were so many lions and other animals that they threatened travelers and shepherds in biblical times. 
Valley of Sidim was a natural site for many large and prosperous cities because of its abundance of water, rich vegetation, and strategic location. From Lebanon and the northern Mediterranean ports, the Jordan Sidim Valley controlled the major trade route to Egypt and the Red Sea ports. Southern Sidim Valley was bounded by bitumen pits. Consequently, the valley was heavily fortified with citadels like Jericho, Beth Sheen, Beth Nimra, and En Gedi, protecting the northern and western approaches. Several fortified cities of the Rephaim were located on the eastern side of the barrier. Based on geological and historical evidence, the Lower Jordan Valley was very different in the past. At the time of Abraham, there was no Dead Sea. Thousands of years have passed since the Dead Sea accumulated its salt content. Ages in Chaos is Velikovsky's discussion of the subject. Velikovsky argues that if salt, sodium, and other sources of accretion brought in by the Jordan River were taken into account when calculating the age of the Dead Sea, it might be less than 6,000 years old, or even 5,000 years old. According to the Bible, the area now occupied by the Dead Sea was once called the Valley or Vale of Sidim. All the latter, that is, the defending kings, joined forces in the Valley of Sidim, now the Dead Sea. As a means of identifying the area of conflict, the chronicler added the phrase, now the Dead Sea. In the Wadi Arabah, the Jordan River flows out of the Valley of Sidim. This water provided luxuriant conditions for the valley. As Genesis tells us, the land was well irrigated. Lot glanced around and saw that the entire Jordan Plain, all the way to Zoar, was thoroughly watered. According to the Haggadah, the valley's fertility is attributed to a network of canals that became the Dead Sea's bases, allowing water from the Jordan River to accumulate. In his Antiquities, Josephus asserts that the lake formed after Sodom was destroyed. It is said that when the eastern kings invaded Palestine, they camped in the valley known as the Slime Pits. At that time, there were pits there, but upon the destruction of the city of Sodom, that valley became the Lake Asphaltites. The Dead Sea was called Lake Asphaltites by the Romans. The five cities destroyed in the Valley of Sidim are Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar Ubela. A geographical and commercial link between these cities appeared to be a trading consortium. Zoar was the only one located in what is now the Dead Sea's northern part. It is clear from Genesis that Lot took his troops to the east, the northern part of the valley, when Abraham and Lot separated their forces. Genesis describes Lot as choosing the whole Jordan plain and settling there, pitching his tent near Sodom among the cities on the plain. The eastward movement must be in the direction of Jericho, which marks the northern edge of the present Dead Sea. A cataclysmic explosion destroyed the cities 18 years later, and Abraham watched the destruction from a mountaintop near Hebron, only 15 miles away. Dawn was the time of the disaster. Genesis tells us that Abraham hurried to the mountaintop and saw smoke rising over the land as he looked towards Sodom, Gomorrah, and the whole plain. Hebron lies west of En Gedi and the central part of the Dead Sea. Likely, the area in the northern and central parts of the valley where Abraham witnessed destruction was the area in which he witnessed the destruction. There is no mention of a body of water in Abraham's gaze as he looks toward the plain. No reference is made explicitly or implicitly to the existence of a body of water that could be interpreted as an inland sea because of the invasion of the eastern kings or the destruction of the cities. Genesis records the invasion of Shinar by Amraphael, the king of Shinar, Elasar by Arioch, the king of Elasar, Elam by Chedorlaume, and Goyim by Tidal, the king of Goyim. Through linguistic affinities or chronological associations, ongoing historical research has not been able to connect these monarchs to known Mesopotamian regions. The land of Elasar has not been identified. Elam is Sumer's eastern neighbor and traditionally its rival. Goyim is the Hebrew word for nations and suggests he led a polyglot group. 
the invading group was led by Chedul Laomer, according to Genesis. Despite making Chedul Laomer the leader of the invasion, the Genesis text and Josephus' writings, the only other religious source, raise many uncertainties. Amraphael, Arioch, Chedul Laomer, and Tidal are called Assyrian kings. According to his assessment of their importance, he ranked them. In Genesis 14, Amraphael and Chedor Laomer are ranked in the same order as Josephus in the invasion account. In the fourteenth year of Chedor Laomer's rule, Chedor Laomer and the allied kings invaded the valley. Genesis continues. In the valley of Sidim, Genesis lists Chedor Laomer, Tidal, Amraphael, and Arioch as the battle leaders. There is a reference to Abraham's victory over Chedor Laomer and the kings who allied with him in Genesis 14. Although the Hebrew chroniclers explicitly state that Elam led the invasion, it is not completely clear that this was true, and one is forced to believe that the text was altered along the way. It would be logical for Amraphael to lead this expedition, since he is the king of Shinar, Sumer. In Genesis, something appears to be amiss, and perhaps the Hebrew chroniclers purposefully diluted the role of the king of Sumer for political reasons. Mesopotamian cities faced a persistent threat from Elam, a traditional rival. Relationships between Sumerian cities and those of Elam were often tempestuous. Ninurta, Enlil's chief military aide, was assigned to Elam by the assignment of lands after the deluge. The Sumerian king list does not include Elam in the list of legitimate cities receiving kingship. Mesopotamian capitals were restricted to cities under Nana Sin's aegis. One of the early kings of Kush smote the weapons of the land of Elam in King List. If Amraphael took an expedition far away to the western lands, he might have had to agree with Elam so as not to leave this powerful adversary behind in Mesopotamia. It is implied by the biblical accounts that Amraphael and Chedor Laomer would lead the expedition together. The third dynasty of Ur is the most likely Mesopotamian dynasty to have produced the invasion king. There is general agreement that the Akkad dynasty was much too early for Abraham's time. During the interim period following the fall of the Akkad dynasty, Mesopotamia was severely disrupted and deprecated by Gutian hordes who had descended from surrounding mountains. Due to the Gutian king's inability to consolidate Mesopotamia's cities, let alone invade the West, these intervening years can be eliminated as candidates for our purpose. Utu Hegal, a puppet king, rebelled and finally rid the country of Gutian occupation. The third dynasty of Ur was established when Ur Namu usurped Utu Hegal's authority and seized control of the Mesopotamian states. The first Babylonian dynasty followed, which is generally considered too recent to exist during Abraham's time. It has been the choice of most scholars to study the third dynasty of Ur. The Sumerian king list indicates the following kings followed the defeat of the Gutians. Utul Hegal ruled Uruk for seven and a half years. Ur Namu ruled Ur for eighteen years after transferring the kingship. His son followed him and ruled for forty eight years. Then Amar Sin ruled for nine years. Shusin ruled for nine years and then Ibisin ruled for 24 years, bringing an end to the dynasty that had lasted 108 years. During Ur Namu's reign, 2103 BC was believed to have begun, and 1995 BC was believed to be the end of the dynasty. Based on explicit statements in Genesis 14, we are looking for one of these kings of the third dynasty of Ur who meets the requirements. For twelve years they, the kings of the Valley of Sidim, served Chedor Laomer, but rebelled in the thirteenth year. Chedor Laomer invaded Palestine in the fourteenth year when the kings allied to him. Therefore, we need a king who reigned for at least fourteen years, preferably a little longer. By doing so, the monarch would have ample time to invade the western lands, impose his will on the cities of the valley for thirteen years, and invade again to subdue the rebellious cities. Secondly, there must have been a period of disintegration before his reign. 
After pacifying and regaining control over Mesopotamia's city-states for several years, he could turn his attention to reclaiming Sargon the Great's distant colonies, which had become independent during the chaotic Gutian period. Lastly, if a king died on an expedition and his troops brought him back hastily, it would abort the invasion to a certain extent. To meet these criteria, the king had to have ruled for at least 14 years, preferably more, and died unexpectedly and suddenly while on an expedition to a distant mountain land at the end of a period of chaos and disintegration of the empire. All these requirements can only be met by one ruler of the Third Dynasty, Ur-Namu, the dynasty's founder. It appears that Ur-Namu ruled for 18 years, according to King List. His short reign was caused by his premature death during an expedition. He moved the capital city to Ur in 2103 after overthrowing Utu-Hegar. A biographical poem about Utu-Hegar describes how the kingship returned to the legitimate Sumerian kings after a hundred years of rule by the barbarian Gutians. He describes how, to get rid of the Gutians and expel them from Mesopotamia, he went to Ishkur, Adad, and Utu, Shama, shrines. This poem omits Nana, Sin, the moon god, and his absence is quite noticeable. As the previous dynasty king suffixed their names with Sin, Utu Hegal did not, which may indicate his overriding ambition and supreme ego. As a result, subsequent rulers of the dynasty, such as Amar Sin, Shusin, and Ibi Sin, attached the deity's name to their own, indicating their continued support for the moon god and his priesthood, but also a careful and discreet precaution against the recurrence of Ur-Namu's fate. Various aristocracies and priesthoods ruled Sumerian cities, supposedly protected by a tutelary deity and supported by the king. The military has been involved in many endeavors. With the rise of a new king and the transfer to another city, the ruling aristocracies also struggled, resulting in significant changes in the pantheon. It is against this political background that Abraham's life and actions are set, for Terah and Abraham were the ruling kings of Ur at the time, Utu Hagar. The struggle for political control culminated in 2106 when Terah and Abraham left Ur for Haran. It was becoming increasingly dangerous for Terah to support Utu and Adad. They left Ur a few years later, and Utu Namu took control of the government and moved the capital to Abraham's hometown. To regain the lost colonies, he conquered the other cities of Mesopotamia and consolidated his power. After a century of independence and wealth, the former Sumerian Empire became independent and prosperous again when he sent or led an expedition to the cities in the west. In these quiet years, Ur-Namu focused on internal affairs. Having recovered empire and received tribute, Sargon could rebuild the roads and regain some of his former glory. He forced a treaty securing their loyalty and tribute for the next twelve years upon the cities of the Valley of Sidim. A cuneiform tablet reveals his outstanding achievements during this time. According to Ur-Namu's self-proclaimed deeds, which have been preserved in later scribal schools, he codified laws that had been suspended during the Hundred Years of Gutianism. The laws were the world's first code of laws and predated the Code of Hammurabi. A great ziggurat dedicated to the moon god Sin was also built by Ur-Namu at Ur. Due to some unknown reason, the cities of the West refused to pay tribute and rebelled against their eastern enslavers. It is likely that Ardard, whose influence over the western lands was considerable, was the initiator. It was from Anatolia that he ruled a Hittite empire that extended all the way to Jerusalem. According to the land division after the deluge, the western lands had been assigned to Sin, so he must have seen the Valley of Sidim as his sphere of control. A vast army of 800,000 men was led west by Ur-Namu in 2085. In addition to taking control of the space facilities at Mount Sinai and Kadesh, Abud punished the rebellious cities in the valley and destroyed the warrior god race, the Rephaim, 
which refuted their traditional ties to the East, thus posing a serious military threat to the empire. A unique feature of Genesis is that it describes Ur Namu's expedition to the West and tracks the route the invaders took. In the 14th year, Chedor Laumer and the kings allied with him defeated the Rephaim near Ashtaroth Kanaim, the Zuzim near Ham, the Emin near Shavekiriataim, and the Horites near El Paran, which lies near the wilderness edge. They then swung back to En Mishpat, now Kadesh, and subdued all the Amalekites' territory and the Amorites in Hazazon Tamor. The army bypassed Lebanon and the Jordan Valley by taking the king's highway along the mountains of Transjordan. According to Josephus, they laid waste all of Syria and overthrew the offspring of the Nephilim. Following the destruction of this line of fortresses, the army moved on to their primary target El Paran and Kadesh in northern Sinai, on the edge of the wilderness. Although El Paran's strategic commercial importance has not been fully explained, it has been generally accepted that it was the main objective of the invading army. Through the Arabah, they swept north and attacked and reduced the citadel of En Gedi, formerly known as Hazazon Tamor, located on the southern approach to the Valley of Sidim. A southward march was made by the kings in response to the approaching threat, or in Genesis, as the passage says, Thereupon, the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Admar, Ziboyim, and Bela, or Zoar, marched forth to engage them in battle at the Valley of Sidim. Asphalt pits were nearby where the battle took place. It was here that the kings of the valley cities were decimated. Some escaped into the surrounding hills, while others were trapped in tar pits and killed. There was a capture of Lot and his men. In the Valley of Sidim, bitumen pits into which the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah jumped when fleeing, others fled into the hills. The invaders seized Sodom and Gomorrah's food and possessions along with Lot, Abram's brother's son. As with the Rephaim cities, the invaders did not intend to destroy the prosperous commercial cities. Cities that paid tribute to Ur were much too valuable as subservient commercial cities. In contrast, the invasion may have been indulgent because of their haste to leave Palestine. Leaving the Jordan River Valley, Abraham's forces attacked them near the Sea of Galilee at dawn. After defeating the defending troops utterly, they looted the cities and took many prisoners, including Lot. A second battle took place near Damascus between Abraham and their enemies. After these engagements, Lot and the other prisoners were liberated, and loot taken from plain cities was reclaimed. Despite their hard-earned gains from Sodom and Gomorrah, Bur Namu's army never faced the enemy for reasons unknown. It is standard practice for the supply train, captured booty, and prisoners to trail the main body of troops during military travel. Clearly, Abraham only encountered the rear guard and not the main body of the departing army. The reason Abraham remained at Hebron with his Egyptian and Anakim, Anunnaki allies is unclear. Abraham did not engage the enemy during the entire episode. The invasion through Transjordan the destruction of El Paran and Kadesh, and the Battle of the Valley of Sidim. When the invaders entered the valley, he would move his army south. In this way, he would have been able to bottle the valley at both ends with a classic pincer movement. Abraham clearly expected the Rephaim defense line to hold or at least slow down the invaders. The narrow valley was probably considered defendable by Lot and the armies of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham could have also waited at Hebron for the attack that never came if he expected a thrust up the Negev towards Jerusalem. After realizing his mistake, he may have chased after the departing armies. After seeing the incredible power demonstrated by the invaders, Abraham realized that he lacked the resources to confront the enemy head-on. After looting the cities, the invaders quickly and resolutely moved up the Jordan Valley. In addition to bypassing Jericho, they did not tarry. It is more like a headlong flight through the Jordan Valley and up to Damascus to return as quickly as possible to their homeland. At this time, Genesis observes 
Abraham committed his troops. A fugitive brought the news to Abraham the Hebrew, who was camping at the Terebinths of Mamre the Amorite, kin to Eshkol and Aner, who were also confederates of Abraham. Abraham called up 318 retainers born into his household when he heard that Lot had been captured and chased him to Don. Abraham's army of 318 seems excessively small, and the number may actually refer to the leaders of armed groups or tribes. Large and fearsome warriors were probably accompanied by iron chariots. As Hebron was a stronghold of the Anakim, it is unclear whether these allies or confederates assisted Abraham in his pursuit of the invaders. In Dan, Abraham's Anakim cavalry caught up with the rearguard of Ur Namu's army. Most booty and prisoners were recovered in the second skirmish near Damascus. In a strange turn of events, Ur Namu did not stand and fight. Abraham's small force could have been easily defeated, but they allowed him to seize their war prizes without a fight. Evidently, they did not feel like fighting and were eager to leave these lands and return home. J. Kinnear Wilson describes Ur Namu's expedition and death in a foreign land in his book The Rebel Lands. According to the tablet, he fell ill in the mountain land and was swiftly taken back to Ur where he was buried on a funeral bier in his palace. They may have rushed home to deliver Ur Namu back to his capital due to his illness. In the cosmic scheme, this was not supposed to happen to the people of Mesopotamia. While he had served the gods well, the tablet states that they had deserted him on the battlefield as if he were a crushed vessel. His ambition may have led to Ur Namu's death. Apparently, Ur Namu used mass destructive weapons that might have backfired and killed him in a tablet commemorating his death. He boasts of reducing the enemy's land to dust and poisoning it with the mighty Uruk weapon. He mentions a fire gas that blew into the house of the rebels. These are all symptoms of nuclear and chemical warfare. In addition to causing his illness and death, Ur Namu devastated Transjordan and the northern Sinai, which remained unoccupied for hundreds of years. A short respite was granted to the cities of the Valley of Sidim. Amid this disorganization, Ur Namu's death and the change in kingship may have allowed them to operate independently. In the end, they were doomed. An explosion occurred 18 years later that destroyed the cities and ruptured the geological fault that underlies the Jordan Valley, sealing off the affluence of the Jordan River. This resulted in the formation of the Dead Sea. Shulgi became the king of Ur with the death of Ur Namu. Sumer enjoyed relative peace and prosperity under his rule for 48 years. Over Elam and Anshan to the east and the Zagros Mountains to the north, Shulgi relentlessly expanded the empire's boundaries. A dingir or star symbol was placed before Shulgi's name in honor of Ur Namu's divinity. As a ruler of Shulgi's ambition, he would not have left the western provinces unsubordinated after subduing the east and north. In this period, no political or military activity is recorded in the scriptures, and it appears that the cities of the Valley of Sidim had returned to the aegis of the Mesopotamian kings and enjoyed prosperity. Abraham and his retinue settled at Mamre near Hebron after the events of 2085. During an exchange with Yahweh or Adad, he complained that he had no descendants to continue the family line. Adad promised him a male heir, and within three years of Ur Namu's invasion, Ishmael was born. Adad indicated continued cordial relations with Egypt by perpetuating Abraham's line through Egypt. Sarah, his second wife, gave birth to Isaac 14 years later. Hagar was abruptly banished to the wilderness with Ishmael, the heir apparent. In the intervening years, Adad's attitude towards Egypt must have changed. In the year before Sodom was destroyed, Adad made a new covenant with Abraham, choosing Isaac to continue the line of Abraham. As well as Adad being Isaac's sire, there is strong evidence for this. In the following year, the valley's cities were destroyed, which presumably contributed to the rift with Egypt and the start of a new dynasty under Isaac. 
Genesis describes the shift from Ishmael to Isaac, in which Adad announces to Sarah that at the age of 90, she is to conceive and bear a son who will be the next heir. Adad seeks a fresh start with the help of his Egyptian allies. I will bless her. In addition, I will give you a son by her, and when I have blessed her, she shall give rise to nations. Taken literally, this means Adad will be the father of the son by Sarah. The Sumerian policy was to mate with human women to provide the aristocracy of kings, generals, priests, and other essential officials needed to run the empire. As a result, they could assure themselves that their wishes would be carried out by a race of demigods they could trust to act as a barrier between them and ordinary humans. The gods of Sumer simply followed Adad's practices. Yahweh's concern for Isaac and his son Jacob in the Old Testament is explained by this. When the rite of circumcision was introduced, the shedding of the foreskin was performed as a symbol of loyalty and a reminder that they are descended from reptilian gods. This represented the reptile shedding his skin and renewing his life symbolically. Hardard also revealed his plans to destroy the cities of the valley when he told Abraham of his new son and heir. Abraham received the news personally from Ardard through three angels at Mumre in Genesis. As part of their aerial survey, the messengers presumably warned Abraham's allies and friends. They warned that they would be destroyed if Abraham could not provide sufficient reasons for not destroying the cities. As the angels flew over the cities in reconnaissance, the men looked down on Sodom from there. Lot's family was retrieved later by two of them from Sodom. These people were brought out and deposited outside the city. They were warned to flee to the hills, lest they be caught in the destruction. After retreating to Zoar in the southern part of the valley, Lot and his family decided to head for the mountains as they were still not safe there. When Lot entered Zoar, the sun rose upon the earth, and Yahweh rained sulfurous fire from heaven down on Sodom and Gomorrah. He overthrew the cities and the plain as well as all the inhabitants of the cities. Josephus and the Haggadah were destroyed, according to Genesis, and some added details. In his writings, Josephus describes how the Lord struck the city with a thunderbolt, setting it ablaze along with its inhabitants. According to this account, sulfurous fire came down from the heavens. This thunderbolt is attributed to the Shekinah, the aerial chariot of the Lord. As soon as the angels brought Lot and his family outside the city, he told them to run for their lives, not to look behind, lest they see the Shekinah which had descended to destroy the cities. Spaceships of Adad or Yahweh descended from the sky to fire a massively destructive weapon to destroy the cities and vegetation of the plain. Probably a nuclear explosion, the flash of the explosion warned them not to look behind them for fear of being blinded. A large inland sea was created due to the explosion or explosions that ruptured the geological fault underlying the valley of Sidim. Abraham witnessed the Holocaust at dawn when he climbed the highest point in Hebron during the Holocaust. The valley is only 15 miles 24 kilometers away from Hebron, so Abraham had a great view from there. As he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and the area of the plain, he could only see smoke rising like fumes from a kiln over the land. The cities of the plain were destroyed by a mushroom-shaped cloud, or was it a nuclear holocaust? The valley of Sidim was destroyed by Adon. In the Third Dynasty, the kings considered these cities too valuable to destroy, so they controlled them and collected tribute from them instead. The destruction of the cities was justified by Adon, however. The eastern kings had depredated the cities, and he had failed to protect them. The space complex at Mount Sinai and the support complex at Kadesh were not secured or prevented from being destroyed by him. Being practical commercial entities and unable to rely on Ardard for protection against the eastern kings, the cities apparently turned to the eastern monarchy for protection. Ardard or Yahweh was a vindictive and vengeful god throughout the Old Testament. His last great act of vengeance appears to have been this one. It may have been the reverse. 
The Egyptians backed down from what they considered an evil alliance between Ardat and Abraham. During this time, Utu also deserted Ardat. Initially occupying Lebanon, Utu may have relocated to the Mount Sinai complex after the dangerous Naram Sin expedition. His western base of operation was destroyed, so he may have returned to Mesopotamia after abandoning both space complexes. Haggadah comments that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because they worshipped the sun and moon gods. Thus, these cities had shifted their allegiance from Adad, the thunder god of the western lands, to Sin and Shamosh, the moon and sun gods. Sidim Valley was the last of many Levantine ruins to be destroyed. Ebla and Amon were destroyed earlier, as well as Lebanon's land. Following that were the Rephaim cities in Transjordan, Mount Sinai stroke Kadesh, and the defensive citadels of southern Palestine. In a fiery cloud, the five cities of the Valley of Sidim disappeared, and the land eventually flooded and became the Dead Sea.